My fellow members, I'd like to welcome you to the 141st Annual Meeting and Strawberry Festival. I don't think coming into today that we never expected we to be wearing masks, uh, or certainly some of the other challenges we encountered this year, namely uh, some key staff turnovers um, and the operating in the continual shadow of COVID. You have much of the information you need in your information packet here or online, so I'm going to keep it short and sweet and stick to some of the headlines. First of all, a thank you not only to the membership, but to the board and our amazing staff. We're operating under anything except the status quo this year, and we pull through the fine colors. I'll let you read about that in the individual committee reports regarding numbers and new members. But again, I don't think anyone would have expected not only this year, but the success we've had given the circumstances. Names are far too numerous to mention, but a profound and deep gratifying thank you to not only the staff, but the individual board members, the committees, for all the work you do on behalf of the club. So, let's talk about the elephant in the room, right? Um, we made the really tough call based on the recommendation of the financial committee to uh, increase dues from 3 to 5% this year. We've talked about it year over year, keeping it around 3%, but with the extraordinary climate, uh, it was inevitable. And we appreciate your not only approving these, but understanding that we're doing them for the best. But there are many silver linings, including the Spider-Man shirt, which I'll talk to in a second. First up, uh, this is the first year that we are proud to announce that we were able to uh, start a retirement fund for our employees. They do just about everything for us. Um, so thank you to Carl Helmetag, as well as Nancy Plunkett, and a few other key individuals for making this happen. Thanks also to the Development Committee uh, for their extraordinary work on behalf of uh, building the endowment and building uh, legacy planning programming as they rolled out to not only to the members, but to select uh, committees as well. So look for more of that. Uh, we also threw a block party this year. It's the first time we ever did that. Uh, we took the two, two dates of the, uh, our most successful little picture show to date to introduce the public to what we were doing. We realized that maybe having balloons as well as sandwich boards out front was a little bit controversial, but we saw over and over again that people are intimidated by that big brass plaque and the big green door that is a little bit reminiscent of Downing Street. And yet they were equally amazed when they came inside this place and didn't realize it was open to the public, even though we advertised it. So uh, we appreciate the support of the staff as well as all the volunteers that were able to pivot at the last moment. And it did pay off. We looked at numbers year over year over year, several years back, and on those two weekends that we threw the block parties, it was two to three times the sales of previous year. So look for more of those to come. Last but not least, when talking about public engagement, we need to speak about the Bannister Project. What started out as a very humble proposal to honor one of our founders, the black artist Edward Bannister, with a sculpture down at Memorial Square, near my alma mater, Rizzi, has instead blossomed into something much bigger, taking us back to our roots. It's about a conversation. Back in 1880, a group of young men and women, including Edward Bannister, started a club, not at this place, but started a club to promote the arts and conversation about the arts. So instead of just placing a statue in a square, we are now having a conversation beyond our wildest expectations, and it's only a year in. So thank you, thank you, thank you to that committee. We are seeing more community partnership come in every day. And what has started out again as an idea for a simple but humble sculpture commemorating this artist is now turning into not only educational programming, but potentially scholarships, um, as well as other projects throughout the community. Again, you can read all that in your annual report, but thank you for the Bannister Committee. So, um, my time at the board here comes after chairing the Education Committee and after sitting alongside seven other presidents. And I bring a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, I happen to work during the day for Hasbro, the toy company, entertainment company. And one of the things we do is continually look for ways to connect with consumers. So we might all have a favorite toy that we grew up with, but this is a big multi-billion dollar business with shared with stakeholders that care about their investments. And part of our responsibility to them is financial. So we look for ways to connect to our audience. It's part of what we do for Hasbro, 
So we work to understand the needs of the consumers. It's, also, it's about delivering to the shareholders, but it's also understanding how to make better product, better experiences. I took that background and applied it to my first 90 days here in this office. So what that meant was not only working with staff, working with board members, working with members, working with committees, and working with the public, just asking questions. How, you, how do you perceive the club? What are we doing good? What are we doing bad? We came up with something in marketing known as a SWOT analysis. I don't want to scare anybody with the marketing terms. Uh, it's simply strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. What are you doing right? What are you doing wrong that you can control? What else is going on out there that's beyond your control? The good news is we're in a great spot. We have a building that's uh, over, uh, an organization that's over 140 years old and still going strong, still attracting members. We have amazingly talented staff. We have amazingly committed membership uh, and amazingly committed volunteers. Some things have changed over the last few years. When I joined the board, uh, we had essentially Seb and Angel Dean, uh, some support staff that helped committees run the business. So we hung shows. We, those things have changed over time. We are so lucky to have people that are professionals in these roles that once were support roles. But what we haven't done is necessarily talk about over time how those swim lanes have learned. So there are some things that we can work on. And I realized that part of what might help came from Hasbro, the idea of having a big three or a big audacious goal that we can all work towards. It frees people up to do their jobs or to bring their passions to work, but it also gives them a set of guardrails so that they know where we're going. So with that in mind, we had some discussion at the board, we presented this to the board, and rolled it out. All the information is available online. I've also sent it out to all the, all the committee members, so most of you have this, but if you're interested, I'm going to go through it really quickly. Because I think it really will show you how not only you can get engaged, but when we talk about some of the things that we're looking to do in the future, it gives it a little more context. So the big three goals. One, expand the PAC experience. What does this mean? It means that while the club was founded 140 years ago by generally young people, uh, we can recognize right now that the cost of running the club doesn't necessarily uh, allow younger people to be members. It doesn't mean we have to rethink the way we do membership. It doesn't mean we have to, 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 to run away from our values. It means we can reapproach how we engage and diversify beyond our members. So we can look to strategic partnerships. We can look at community collaborations. We can look at planting seeds so that 5, 10, 15 years down the road as people age up and into a time in their lives or a place in their lives where they have the money, they're able to join the club. Goal number two. Promote art and patronage. We're talking about new ways to attract and engage buyers. We're talking about amplifying our online presence and capabilities. We're talking about revisiting the idea of marketing. It's a whole new world out there. We have more online information coming at us and going out than ever before. If you're going to see something shortly, it might even be this most recent newsletter about how you as members best receive information. Because right now we have constant contact, we have a newsletter, we have a website, we have an Instagram channel. And to be honest, we haven't done a, any sort of uh, media study to understand how it serves you best or serves the club best. So we recognize that the club was founded to promote art and patronage. And we also recognize that we have a lot of amazing people, but maybe not the best infrastructure to support it. Finally, sustainability. What does this mean? Well, people think about it as a big green dream right now, but it really means a few things. Financial stability. So we talked up front. Um, in leaning into planned giving, legacy giving through the development committee. It's also about um, increased awareness, I think critically, about Providence Art Club's historic place in Providence. So, you know, I mentioned it with the little pictures and the, the block parties. So many people walk by and take a photo of our amazing Fleur de Lis building and then they keep walking because they, they don't understand who we are or what we do. They don't understand our place. And when you walk in, the first one of the first things you see is in the cafe is a uh, John Howard Benson silhouette with uh, our art club seal. We were founded three years after Risty, but he did both of our seals. There's a common connection on the hill here that we maybe walked away from a little bit. And when people find out about this place, which is kind of Hogwartsy, if you want to use contemporary parlance, they're totally blown away by it. So sustainability means continuing as stewards to make sure that people find out about the club and understand our true role, not only in Providence, but in, in the history of, uh, you know, we were the first club founded by men and women and a person of color. 
all the way back then. Uh, and then the last one on these financial stability. And we talked about the, the hard choice to increase dues again this year. Uh, we, we took out um, some money a little while back to build an amazing classroom and an amazing kitchen. Um, we're paying for that stuff um, to provide for the future. If you look at your little handbook or the, or the, the art book, book um, you know, the, the, the 10 men and six women back in 1880 did pledge. Their, it says, I, we do pledge ourselves to assume our rightful share of the expense, providing it does not exceed $6. Now, back then, they didn't own the building. They got together down the street on North Main Street uh, back in February to form this uh, club. And they were looking for buildings. They could not foresee the campus that we had. They could not foresee the clubhouse or the kitchen or the classroom or the Fleur de Lis building uh, or the Deacon Taylor. All these things that we have is this amazing experience. They also didn't foresee a parking lot, which is kind of problematic for us right now. But again, this was like 20, 22 years before the first automobiles rolled off the assembly line. So you've kind of forgiven that. They were still 10 years past the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, but you know, it, it's about finding ways to keep the club going. And we understand that it, with the not only the physical plant, but all the amazing people we employ and all the amazing things we do to get the word out to the public it does cost money to run. So, uh, let's go to Spider-Man, right? It may seem a little odd, but follow me here. Our club, celebrating 142nd, we're coming into our 142nd year. A lot has changed. But we are still true to our mission. If our founders walk in the door, even though some of the details wouldn't be the same, they would largely recognize the place. It was founded by a group of young men and women, and some slightly older people, to promote arts and arts culture, to find a way to show and sell their art, to have these conversations. We're still doing it, which is amazing. It was also a product of their time. So, like I said, they're coming now 10 years after the Transcontinental Railroad. They don't have cars or flight in their future yet. They're a product of their time. This guy here, Spider-Man, he just celebrated his 60th birthday, 60 years. And you know what he did last year? He made $1.9 billion at the box office, which is crazy. Think about that, follow me, follow me. The kids that were five years old, or seven, or 13 in 1960, still can recognize Spidey to this day. He still swings from the, from the, you know, you see his webs. He's got the, the spidery eyes and the red and the blue. But he reflects the times. And we can do the same thing here. We have a very compelling, very relatable story, just like this web slinger does, that can change and belong and be of the times without disconnecting from the core. If we look at the changes that have happened within the club over the last few years, since I came on board, and since I took on education, when I took on education with Carol Fitzsimons back in, just after 2005, we had 12 classes. In 1983, we had just two. This year we offer over 71 classes. Folks, there was a time when I first joined the club that we were shut down completely during the summertime. And even offering a workshop was a revelation. So now the fact that we are, again this summer, filled to the brims with workshops and we have people traveling from out of state is phenomenal. So, in closing, a little bit more on the homework assignment. And a reminder, the young men and women that founded this club back in 1880 founded it as a place to get together to talk about art. They did not found it as a private club. We are technically a 501c3, which is an arts nonprofit, for public benefit, not a 501c7 private club. Keep that in your mind when we talk about how we plan and how we talk and what we do. And also think about when those young men and women created this place, what they were doing. So if you get out the door and look into Providence right now, the amazing amount of plant-based food the amazing amount of pop-up distilleries and, and uh, or the distilleries, oh, distilleries that are hosting pop-up events. Those events are being, and, and those restaurants, those experiences are being created by young people who see a need, whose needs are not being met. We also benefit, so we have amazing, you know, Black Bean Burger now, and we can go anywhere and pretty much shop for that stuff. But it, those people that created the club are being reflected by the people now that are saying, hey, we need more of this. If you look at what Water Fire Arts Centers do and their accelerated program, if you look at what Jamestown Arts Center do, ASG 20 before that, 
uh, you know, what's happening in Pawtucket with all the breweries. It's happening because younger people are not seeing those things reflected in their culture or not seeing it provided to them. Likewise, what's going on up and down with our neighbors in College Hill. So as a homework assignment, I would ask you to look and see what is going on in Providence so that when we start to have those conversations about where we want to take the club, we could be mindful about how we might be serving the greater arts organizations in our state, how we might be solved, what we might be missing. So when I talk about what we, what we might be missing, we can use that big three to frame it up. Does it expand the art club experience? Does it promote art and patronage? Does it promote sustainability? Certain projects tick all those boxes immediately, right? Banish the project. But if we look at other opportunities we might have, those are going to be the similar criteria. So for instance, right now the board is in conversation, has been reviewing proposals for not only artist scholarships for younger artists, but an artist residency program, as well as a fellowship program for more seasoned artists. We're also looking at where we might have additional opportunities within the, our campus for gallery space. We saw amazing responses to a show that the gallery staff planned during the pandemic, with essentially a Rhode Island Invitational, and how much life that brought. As a side, the renovation in Dodge House back in 1984, the, the people that undertook it initially renovated those parlors because they were looking for additional gallery space. Now we backtracked a little bit and said, no, no, it's more important they be preserved historically. But again, what is our mission about? So when we look to expand the galleries, we're not saying we're going to do it, but with this framework, we have the criteria to make that evaluation a little bit more easily. And just as an aside, those beautiful parlors in the front, back in the least according to our history book, uh, back in 1984, their original renovation was because they were looking at additional gallery space. So we backtracked and we decided that we wanted to maintain some of the historical integrity there, but, uh, but again, it, this is not a museum. This is a living, breathing space that's created for and by artists for the enjoyment of the arts. So I've taken up enough of your time. Uh, I want to end with uh, what my mentor and our good friend Tom Segers would say, for God's sakes, take care of yourselves. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Trudy Bill Main. I'm the Secretary of the Board of Managers of the Providence Art Club. I'm going to start with the sad news first, the necrology. We lost 10 art club members this year. I'm just going to read the list and then at the moment, at the end, just pause for a moment. Silence. Ms. Sally Ann Matrone was an exhibiting artist member since 2001 and she passed away on August 7th, 2021. Ms. Joan Thompson, Bogosian, an exhibiting artist member since 1982, and she passed away on September 7th, 2021. Dr. Louis A. Corvese, patron member since 1989, and he passed away on October 16th, 2021. Mrs. Loretta McKittrick, she was a president's list member. She joined in 1988. And she passed away on November 10th, 2021. Mr. William M. Barnum, an exhibiting artist member since 1997, and he passed away on November 11th, 2021. Mrs. Ann Dong, exhibiting artist member since 1998, and she passed away on November 19th, 2021. Ms. Colleen S. Covington, she was on the president's list. She joined in 1994 and passed away on December 1st, 2021. Mr. John Clark Wheatley, an exhibiting artist member, joined in 2001 and passed away on December 25th, 2021. Mr. Preston A. Atwood, who is a patron life member, he joined in 1970 and passed away on December 27th, 2021. And finally, Ms. Ms. Domini Becerra Argosta, an exhibiting arts member. She joined in 1997 and passed away on February 25th, 2022. 
We now have some good news. We have a total membership of 648. That's 434 women and 214 men. 334 are artist members and 314 are patron members. 44 are life members. We have several new life members. Suzanne Dixon Albert, Linda Dewey, Janice Godreau, Philip Lieberman, and Nancy Lee. As of 2022, we have many past presidents still with us. Carly Bartlett, Anthony Guccieri, David DiPerchino, Robert Emlin, Dan Meshing, Alice Miles, Thomas Riley, Robert Benedetto, Nancy Gosher Thomas. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joan McConaughey. I'm chair of the membership committee. And this year, our membership numbers have reached a record breaking high at 647 members. A year ago, I announced 26 new and reinstated members. This year, I am thrilled to announce and welcome 62 new and reinstated members. And I apologize in advance if I mispronounce your name. From May of 2021 through April of 2022, we have 41 patrons. They are Lisa Browning, Michael Fluxman, Geraldine Christ Cooper, Karen Canopesk, Laurel Davis Uber, Vanessa Weiner, Louise Freshler, Gregory Todd, Mark Swidlow, Brenda Brock, Mindy Wichenheim, Green Statement, Andrew Teitska, Carolyn Roberts, O'Neill Attar, Ann Keeger, Karen Brooks, Jason McCary, Jerry C. Dane, Green Statement, Rhonda Salento, Judith Brock, Jody Brumman, Eve Drake Bayer, Melanie Lusa, Chelsea Howington McWillie, Kristen Adamo, Jeffrey Williams, Willa Perlman, Allison Gaines Pell, Barbara Link, Deborah Drinker, Sandra Deach, Sarah Verado, Nancy Cassidy, Stephen Foley, Kate Bryan Nordstrom, Ruth Warnes, Carol Beck, Ian Hagen Webb, Keith Michael Ratcliffe, Danny Bullock, Karen Baker. There are nine exhibiting artists. There are nine exhibiting artists. Walker, Cecilia Delgado, Bob Dilworth, Jill Tyler, Patricia Schneider, Katie Cannell, Tracy Wiseman, Margaret Walsh, and Barbara Crane. There were 12 arts professionals. They are Jillian Lauren Kelshaw, Leanne Lightwood, R. Tripp Evans, Sarah Gaines Blythe, Kelly Brown, David Andriosi, Leela Barclay de Tolley, Cindy Emery, Claire Andre Watkins, Pamela Lambert, Catherine Burt, reinstatement, Tenley Vanderwall. We also have five members who transferred their status to exhibiting artists, and I'd like to read their names. Nancy Springer, B. Gibbons, Nancy Driggs, Miriam Rosani, and Tony Burton Sini Dunville. Welcome to new members and congratulations to everyone. The full membership report is available online for you to read. I do want to remind everyone, although our numbers are very strong now, it is important for us to maintain those membership statistics. And that is accomplished when each of us act as ambassadors to our club. We encourage all members to consider proposing a friend, colleague, or family member for membership. The process is simple. If you have any questions about sponsoring a new member, please feel free to 
reach out to me or any member of the committee. The other committee members are Judy Vilmaine, who is the vice chair, Birch Coffey, Trip Evans, Kate Chu, Paige McGratton, Dawn Robinson, Kathy Terrell, and Susie Reeves. You can also reach out to Julia Hubbard in membership services or our general manager, Seth Watches. In closing, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the committee members and for staff support from Julia and Rihanna. I am so grateful for all the help and work done by each and every one of them. By now, you may have heard about the Studio Tips Handbook. It was a project directed by Birch Coffee. It contains 50 tips on how to streamline your art making process. This makes for a great gift for any person who wants to make art or any artist. We only printed 100 copies and half of them are already sold. You can order from our website while the supplies last. Also, stay tuned for details on other social events for you to showcase the club to potential members. Like the Madness Party that we host in October. It's going to be exciting and you won't want to miss it. Stay tuned and keep checking the website for updates. Be safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Hello, I'm Carl Helmetag, treasurer of the Providence Art Club. The Art Club's fiscal year, ending April 30th, 2022, is not yet finalized. However, it will reflect improved operating results as our members emerge from COVID and embrace the wonderful art, dining, and classes that the club offers. Let's look at the past year. Your board of managers approved a 21-22 budget with an operating loss of $145,000. This budget factored in increased use of the club by its members, but also considered that larger gatherings, such as weddings, would be quite limited due to the lingering impact of the COVID variance. I am pleased to report that the club's operating performance was significantly better than budgeted. It will be close to a break-even year. This improvement was primarily driven by strong membership gains. Additionally, while party income was, as expected, quite modest. Member use of the cafe was ahead of budget and our food cost ratio was favorable. As noted in my previous report, the club separates its financial statements into operating, day-to-day -day operations, and non-operating items such as depreciation, investment gains, and grants. In non-operating items, the club received forgiveness for its second PPP loan. The forgiveness of this $209,000 loan, as well as the strong performance of our investment portfolio, further strengthened our balance sheet. We utilized our strong cash position to invest more than $125,000 in improvements to the club's facilities. These included a new tankless hot water system, new HVAC units in most areas of the club, and significant roof repairs. Additionally, I'm pleased to announce that we added $100,000 to our debt reduction fund. This fund, which now stands at more than $600,000, will be used to repay a $1 million balloon payment that will be due in 2028. It's wonderful to be more than halfway to that goal. The above being said, club faces financial challenges in the year ahead. We, like other businesses, are experiencing dramatic inflationary increases in utility, operating, and food costs. Additionally, we will see increased compensation costs to retain our amazing staff. These costs are not only direct compensation, but for example, a much needed addition of a retirement program and health care cost increases. In consideration of the exceptional cost pressures the club faces, the Board of Managers is recommending a 5% increase in the monthly dues to help defray these expenses. With an increase of $4.50 per month for artists and $6 per month for patron members, this increase will generate an additional $30,000 of additional income to support operations. Your club continues to be in a strong financial position. The Board of Managers, in concert with the Finance and Investment Committees, 
has made the necessary decisions to get to this place. As always, though, it is our employees that make the art club such a special place. Each does an exceptional job. In closing, I would like to acknowledge Nancy Plunkett. She recently departed for another opportunity, but deserves special thanks for the work she did in providing accurate and timely financial statements, as well as securing grants such as the PPP loans. My best wishes to her. Brenda Kurz has joined us as bookkeeper. She will be handling the back office accounting aspects of the club. Finally, I wish to acknowledge Julia Hubbard. She of many hats at the club has stepped up to handle our payables and receivables while we search for Nancy's replacement. Thank you, Julia. Good evening. We'd like to tell you a little bit about the Bannister Community Art Project. In 2020, the Providence Art Club was the recipient of a generous gift by an anonymous donor. The gift, a bust of founder Edward Mitchell Bannister by sculptor Gage Prentice, is now on display in the Founders Home. This gift was the impetus for a new project titled the Bannister Community Art Project that celebrates the life and legacy of one of our PAC founders, Edward Mitchell Bannister. It was during this time that an advisory committee was formed, and later, in 2021, a steering committee was created to assist in the realization and installation of a public art sculpture in honor of Mr. Bannister. It is our goal that this project create a broader platform for community engagement, expand the Providence Art Club's vision and mission, and engage in public dialogue that will encourage critical community partnerships while building and maintaining cross-culture relationships. We do this by working with community leaders and organizations in promoting Bannister's historic role and contributions through exhibitions, education, a call for public art, and discussion for Bannister scholarship. As the co-chair of the Bannister Community Art Project, I am happy to be working side by side with Jennifer Davis Allison, friend and co-chair for the project. A non-member, Jennifer is the principal owner of Partners Training and Consulting, a training and consulting services firm that uses its unique talents, experience, and abilities to work collaboratively with clients in creating solutions that are tied to key business initiatives and contribute to success. Partners focus is on enhancing the ability of individuals and organizations to meet head on the issues of growth and change in a highly competitive and diversified marketplace. And now Jennifer Davis Allison. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy asked me to say a few words about what attracted me to this project. What attracted me to the project was legacy. Being able to contribute in some small way in forwarding and regarding the talent, achievements, and impact of the gentleman, Edward M. Bannister, drew me. The next thing I knew, I was lunching with Nancy in the Pack Garden, and the rest is history. It's become a true legacy project, not only for Bannister, but for me as well. I am growing, learning, and benefiting every day from working with this project. Famously, Edward Bannister was the first known artist of African ancestry to win an international prize in the US for his pastoral landscape under the oaks at the Centennial International Exhibition, America's first World's Fair held in Philadelphia in 1876. Edward Bannister was a dynamic force and founder of the Providence Art Club and helped to transform Providence into a cultural powerhouse. Edward Mitchell and Christiana Carto Bannister created and contributed to extraordinary institutions of art, culture, and civic responsibility that endure over a century later. Now, an ambitious campaign has begun to create a stunning life-size sculpture of the renowned Mr. Bannister. 
seated on a public bench with a sketchbook and pencil in hand, Bannister will be seen in front of Market Square overlooking the Providence River. Gage Prentice, sculpture of the statue, remarks, in a moment he lived countless times in his life. There, he will welcome visitors to sit beside him and learn about his life, his legacy, and his lessons. I want to help him cast a shadow beyond Providence. Not only was Bannister a great artist, but an abolitionist, philanthropist, thinker, and personality of Providence. As of late, the National Gallery of Art in Washington announced the acquisition of the Palmer River, an oil painting by Bannister, originally owned by our own Providence Art Club president, Dan Neshman, which sold at auction for a record $277,000. Nancy, thank you. In a short period of time, we have received donations in all amounts from individuals and organizations ranging in size from $25 up to a $100,000 grant. We are close to reaching our immediate goal of raising $200,000 to fund the statue and are hoping with your help we can close the gap. We are excited, eager, and encouraged by the immediate response from various public leaders and individuals in the community. The list of community partners and outreach continues to grow. Some of those included are the City of Providence, Mayor Jorge Alorza, Tomahawk Museum, the Providence Preservation Society, the Rhode Island Historical Society, Pepito Opportunity Connection, Rhode Island Foundation, Providence Foundation, just to name very few. There are so many more to thank. And they are also listed in the annual meeting report. I would like to recognize our steering committee, Nancy Springett, Claire Andre Watkins, Rene Barrow, Miriam Coleman, Bob Dilworth, Wayne Franklin, Lorraine Maloney, Jean Kadeke, and Betsy Zimmerman. Advisory committee, Ray Rickman, Rob Dimmick, Dan Meshnick, Ted Mattis, Gil Ginnity, and myself. This project is not only a local story, but a much larger one on a national level. There are many stepping stones to this project that begins with the bricks and mortar, the sculpture, education, exhibitions, and ultimately the commitment to changing the culture. As a member of the Providence Art Club, we hope you will join us in becoming part of this historic moment in time by helping to continue the momentum that has begun and learn more about how you may support and become involved in making this project a reality. You may find more information by visiting bannisterproject.org. Thank you and enjoy the Strawberry Festival. Since 1960, we've awarded the Providence Art Club Medal to individuals for their outstanding contributions to the club, to the broader art scene, or their, for their individual achievement in the arts. It gives me great pleasure today, and probably this is going to be the only time it happens, to present to two not only cherished members, but to birthday mates. I'd like to present this first award before calling on my colleague to Nancy Gosher Thomas. One quick word, I think those you know, Nancy, know her, she'll speak a little bit. I've known her since our time in the Pawtucket Arts Collaborative. She is tremendously committed to the community. What she has given to the art club over and over again throughout the years is echoed in her involvement in what she's done for the broader community. And most recently, it's all come together as part of the Bannister Project. So Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's always wonderful to be recognized for your work, but it's particularly wonderful receiving this award from longtime friend and now president, Sean Kennedy. 
I'll keep this short and sweet. Collectively, as artists, we have a powerful voice that can be the catalyst for change in our communities. Art and culture have the ability to enhance our quality of life, to, public, to provide public engagement, and promote economic growth. I learned early on that being an artist was not really a choice, it was something inherent. However, with that also came a responsibility to advocate for the arts and to make it easily accessible to others. The Providence Art Club is the gem on Thomas Street. Our roots run deep, our members passionate and welcoming to all that pass through our doors. In 2019, as COVID devastated the country, many members expressed their gratitude for the Providence Art Club, saying it had become a safe place that offered support and comfort. It's no wonder that so many seek to belong to this amazing community. I'm appreciative and so grateful for this award. And I thank, I thank you, Sean, and I thank the membership. Again. Thank you for everything you've done for the club. And now I'd like to introduce my general manager, Seth Borges, for the presentation of the next medal. Good evening, members of the Province Art Club. It is a true pleasure and an honor for me to be standing in front of you and presenting Angel Dean with a very prestigious Art Club medal. Angel Dean walked into the Providence Art Club January 1995, and she changed the fabric of this club with her personality, her talent, and her wisdom. I've had the pleasure of working with Angel for 24 years, and then she retired. Maybe that says something. The Art Club Medal is awarded to folks that make a contribution to the arts. And Angel certainly made a contribution to the Prince Art Club with her straightforward attitude, honesty, and she laughed at every joke that I told her. Uh, she told me when I had good jokes and when I had bad jokes. I had more bad jokes than good jokes, according to her. But it is, it's true pleasure that I stand here and award Angel Dean the Art Club Medal. Angel has really changed my life and my family's life in a lot of ways. Uh, Angel's an animal lover. She got us our first dog, um, which really changed our family. Um, when, uh, when she had her dogs, she used to bring them into work. It really changed the dynamics of the third floor where Angel used to sit um, with myself other employees. Uh, we actually named her dog Buggy, the CPO, Chief Petting Officer. Um, but again, that's that's just how Angel is. She she brings things in, changes fabrics, people's way of thinking. Um, she's been a tremendous advocate to the Province Art Club. Besides being a wonderful artist. Um, She's a wife. She has a dog, Airy, now, uh, which we've met a few times. But that's just Angel. Um, this medal should be about this big for Angel. That is how large her heart is, and that's how Angel will be remembered here as an employee of the Prophet Side Club. There has been one other employee that has received this medal, and I welcome you to the club. Angel, would you come up and accept this prestigious award, the Province Art Club Medal? Aw, thank you, Seth. You're very welcome. My pleasure. 25 years of dedication to the Province Art Club. When I received the phone call to let me know I needed to come for the filming and I would be receiving it, I was 
shocked. Um, but then the more I thought about it, the art club has always treated their employees really well. And I always felt appreciated. I always felt like I could be myself and I could grow. And Seth is a fabulous boss. He, uh, he lets his employees um, grow at their own pace and take on new work, new projects. And um, anyway, it was, it was wonderful to work here for 25 years and bring my little dog and take art classes. And then I think about all the wonderful people I've met over the years. Even, you know, Maxwell Mays, who started the uh, Art Club Medal. And um, I started thinking about all the wonderful artists and members. And it's, you know, it's, I, I've been fortunate fortunate to know them all. So thank you so much. This means so much to me. I haven't been this happy in a long, long time. Um, really, really surprised and um, have a heart full of gratitude. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, members of the Province Art Club, board members, staff. I stand before you as I have for the last 24 years as proud to be a general manager. So, the year in review. Last year, we came off a three-day annual meeting, which was an awesome party. Um, minimal staff, maximum fun. Last summer, it was a very quiet summer for us, uh, filled with workshops, not a lot of diners, obviously uh, due to COVID. Uh, that's changed this year. We are picking up in business. We've had some um, staff changes, obviously uh, the leaving um, of Nancy Bucket. Uh, it's not often that a general manager is also portrayed as an actor. Uh, I'm so fortunate um, to be part of this club. I'm sure some of you know that I was in two plays last year. They actually wanted this in two plays last year, um, which was amazing. Both of those times, as I drove home, thinking about that's what it must have been back in the day when the club was full of energy, full of life, partying, little drinking. Um, and I was part of that, not the drinking part of it. Uh, but it's an amazing how I'm treated here at the art club and why I've stayed here for 24 years and how my staff is treated is because of our membership. I have not forgotten about the support that these folks have put forth to our staff. Um, this is not a job for me. It's not a career. This is what I do. I haven't worked a day. In 24 years, I have not worked one day because I love what I do. I also do surround myself with people that do the same. So I'd like, love to honestly thank my staff. Again, uh, I'm very fortunate in what I do. I have, without a doubt, the best staff in the entire world. They're dedicated. They've proven that. They are caring. They've proven that and they're intelligent, they've proven that. Um, we are dedicated to member services here at the Art Club every single day. And when we have a setback, we take two steps back and we go four steps forward. That's what our staff does. Um, I hope you all see it. I've seen it, especially in this shortage of staffing that uh, the world is in the middle of. Um, I can assure you that the folks that are here are working hard, having fun. Even once in a while, they laugh at my jokes. Think of that one. Uh, so again, thank you to my staff. Thank you to the members. And thank you for the Province Art.